I'm back. I want to apologize for what was definitely a longer wait between videos than I intended to, but I think that that brings up a greater point about the human condition. Allow me to get philosophical. We're getting right into it. No matter how much time you think you have, it's never enough. For so long, when I was working 40 hours a week before the disease that shall not be named, I told myself, man, if I just had more time, I'd, I'd read so many books. I'd learn so much. I'd make a successful YouTube channel. And now I have all the time in the world. And I don't do those things. Most of the time, I lay around in my bed and I go, there's just not enough time. There's just not enough time to do that YouTube video. And of course, four hours go by and I've made nothing. But nevertheless, welcome back to the messy desk. And I'm pleased to inform you it's only gotten more messy. We got crushed water bottles over here. We got random quarter inch cables there, a Lego piece my son left there. We got bread ties, we got screws. Welcome back, everybody. Today, I want to talk to you about trigless triggers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, if this seems totally foreign and unfamiliar to you, don't blame yourself. Uh, blame yourself a little bit. You should always feel guilty for something. I mean, if I'm the only source of your guilt today, I think you're doing just fine. But for the most part, I don't hear people talking about trigless tricks enough. And for what they do, they should be talked about a lot more uh, because they're pretty dang spanking neat. So today we're going to talk about the myriad uses of trigless trigs, um, the applications, and sort of build on this trilogy of videos that I've made now that are kind of all about taking a pattern and stretching it for all it's worth so that it's not so abundantly clear that you have put a kick on 1, 5, 9, and 13 and a snare on 5 and 13 and called it a fucking day. Even though, even though that's, that is what we do. Sometimes we do do that and it's okay, but we gotta hold up some sort of facade here, guys. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I'm sure that there are plenty of uses for trigless trigs that I'm missing here. Um, and please, please yell them at me in the, be rude about it to me in the comments. Cause I gotta be real with you guys. The comments are too fucking nice. I want mean comments. This dude shat on me about wearing pink nail polish. I love it. I live for it. So if I'm missing something here, call me a fucking idiot. Be like, hey, stupid. You forgot this obvious application of them. Are you sure you're qualified to be a father? The answer to that is no. Regardless, these are the uses that I have found for them in my exploration of the Octatrack over the past two years. So yeah, let's just fucking get into it, dude. One good example is using a trigless trig, something like an envelope. Um, and so if you're unclear, these green trigs here are trigless trigs. And um, you know what? I am getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about what the fuck a trigless trig is first, and then we'll talk about how to apply them. A trigless trig is exactly what it sounds like. So let's move on. I'm kidding. A trigless trig is basically setting down a little mark in the sequencer that says, hey man, I don't want you to trigger the sample that I have locked to this track, but I do want you to change in some way. And that is gonna come in the form of parameter changes. So for instance, if I have a clap and I want the delay time of the clap to slowly uh, speed up or slow down, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, you obviously can't have that happen with a normal parameter lock. You can have the delay mix be turned up or the delay send be turned up rather. Um, you can change the delay time for that exact trigger, but if you want it to over time after it has triggered to slowly wind down, you need to use a trigless trig for that. So that is what a trigless trig is used for. That is what a trigless trig is. Uh, in its basest form. It is just telling the sequencer, change something, but don't trigger anything while you're changing it. So change the way a bass filter opens, but please don't trigger the bass again. Um, you know, change how distorted this kick drum is sounding, you know, after it hits, let's say it's a kick with a particularly long tail, like it's a sub kick. Change how the distortion or bit crushing um, affects that, but don't trigger the kick again, etc., etc., etc. You can take that pretty admittedly simple concept and much like a lot of things on the octatrack 
uh, stretch it out and do a whole lot of stuff with it. So let's talk about some of the ways that I use Trigless Trigs. Um, the first and most immediately obvious one is using it like an envelope. Um, so if you're familiar with synthesis at all, you know that an envelope is something that is um, applied typically to amplification or to a filter that changes the sound over time. So you have an attack that rises up to whatever change you're making. So let's just use a filter opening as an example. You have an attack that says the filter takes this long to open up, a decay that says it takes this long to fall down to the sustain point, the sustain point where it hangs out at, and then the release uh, as it falls off. Side note, check it out. Your boy got married. Sick brag, right? Um, let's use that as an excuse for why it's taken me like two months to make another video, not just sheer laziness. Anyway, envelopes can be used in a similar way because obviously you have three LFOs per track, but you don't always want to commit to using LFOs if you want to use them for different things. And obviously envelopes differ from LFOs in that they are not looping. Um, obviously there are looping envelopes uh, that exist, but for the most part an envelope does its thing and then is done. Um, and that is particularly attractive in terms of one-off modulation. Like, yes, I want my filter to open and snap shut once. I don't want it to keep doing that over and over again uh, because I'm not making dubstep in 2008. So that's that's one of the first uses. And so I have an example here. So let's first listen to um, my music because the first thing we do always is listen to my music because I'm what's important here. Uh, let's take a gander with our ear holes. Okay, so obviously that's a perfect song and nothing could be changed about it and nothing should be changed or will be changed. But what's going on? So for a clear example of Trigless Trigs being used in this instance like an envelope, uh, let's look at the bass track here. So let me mute everything else here so it's very clear what's happening. What I have happening here is after this bass note triggers, it's quite a long sustained note, I have, let's go to the effects, I have... Uh, sample rate reduction and bit rate reduction just slowly moving up here. Um, and the effect that that creates is this um, kind of stepped modulation. It's it's not smooth, and I guess that's worth talking about when it comes to um, trigless trigs on the Octatrack. It seems inconsistent. Sometimes the modulation comes across quite smoothly, uh, but other times with sample rate and bit rate reduction. Maybe this has something to do with interpolation. I don't know. But with the sample rate and the bit rate, um, it comes across very stepped. It's not a smooth modulation. It's very kind of glitchy, which uh, for my purposes, I, I enjoy. So let's, let's listen really quick. Now notice something changes here. So what's happening? So we know that the bit rate and sample rate are being ratcheted up over time, but this last trigger here, this tri last trigless trig on 11, everything is set to zero. And a really cool thing to keep in mind about trigless trigs is that like any trigger, there can be trigger conditions on it. So this happens every second time. So that what happens is one time the modulation is just kind of let to flow free and just chill and go on let to run its course entirely before the sequencer comes back around. And the second time, it cuts it off. Um, and so that creates a kind of fun variation. So let's see if we just put in the drums and the bass. Now coming back around, and it stops. So it's pretty neat. Um, so that's a very simple way to use the kind of envelope technique. Another thing that you can use trigless trigs for is similar to the envelopes, kind of more precise modulation of things. Something that I've used as an example here, and this is another thing that kind of blew my mind when I found out, is let's move to pattern three here. You can put trigless trigs on the master. 
Uh, and so I've done that here to create this sort of precise master modulation that you wouldn't otherwise be able to have. And what this allows you to do is have sort of precise and, for lack of a better word, stackable modulation on your master track that otherwise you would have to commit all your three LFOs to. So you can save your LFOs for other stuff if you want to. Um, I'm a weird person, so I rarely actually use the LFOs. Um, I just get more joy out of being very precise rather than having happy accidents occur. Uh, but I do use LFOs from time to time. But anyway, so what I've done here is um, let's start near the end of the sequencer because this will be relevant in a second. What I have here is, uh, let's go to the effects. I have the filter slowly uh, coming up in high pass. And then what happens is the weird thing with trigless trigs is that once you've set a parameter to something, the sequencer is going to hold that parameter until another trigless trig tells them to tells it to stop. Um, so what that means is if I leave this, um, say, at, you know, this high pass value, if I leave it at 78, and it comes back around to the beginning of the sequence, even if there are no trigless triggers here, or specifically if there are no trigless triggers here, it will hold at that value of 78, at that high pass value, or whatever the parameter is. Uh, until I tell it to do something else. Um, and so that's important to keep in mind if you are putting some trigless trigs at the end of your pattern, what you absolutely must do, provided you want it to snap back to normal as the pattern uh, restarts, is to have a trigless trig at the start that sets your parameters uh, back to some sort of normal. Now, granted, that's not what I have going on in this case, uh, because the filter pulling up into a high pass and snapping back to being fully open was just a little too... A little too jarring for me so what i did was i pulled it up to 78 and then here it even goes a little higher to 84 and then it starts moving down slowly and eventually it ends up back at normal so it's kind of this let's just play it So it's, it's a little more smooth. And something else you'll notice is that reverb. Uh, what I have going on here is that I have another trigless trig um, that is sending everything through the reverb. Um, and it kind of creates this long tail. And that tail holds for a bit because, again, until there was another trigless trig telling it to change parameters, it will hold those parameters. I have It looks like nothing has changed, but this is the next page. I have it the mix down quite a bit. And then finally it comes... Uh, down to zero here. Um, in fact, this should be down a little bit more here. And so what you get and then it's down. So it's this kind of smooth descent. Right? Um, so that can be very useful for a variety of different things. Another technique you could use these trigless trigs for, which is something that I've done in the past but don't have a complete enough project to show you here, is put a comb filter on your master and then create sort of one of those pitched sequences that I've talked about in previous videos where on your master track you could put a bunch of trigless trigs in where you want the comb filter to change pitch. And you could change feedback and, and you know, you understand you can extrapolate this in many different ways. So that's that was a really exciting thing for me to find out uh, when I found out that you could do this on the master track. I'm not really sure what normal triggers on the master do, if they do anything. And if you know, uh, please tell me, because I'm, I'm not reading the fucking manual. That's for chumps, isn't it? Something else we could do so that this is a little less repetitive, even if we wanted to, is put a trigger condition on this to say, maybe happen every first time, happen every second time. And you can continue to, can continue to iterate like that. And you can kind of combine those two things, right? We've combined the envelope kind of technique slowly opening. We've combined the more precise modulation of very slowly and precisely opening the filter and then slowly moving it back down that an LFO wouldn't really easily be able to do. I mean, obviously you could tweak it, but doing it kind of hands-on uh, is helpful. And it's like that, that these techniques stack on top of each other. Um, a less obvious uh, application of trigless triggers is using them to get around the limitations of the hardware you're using. Uh, in this case, obviously the Octatrack, but this applies to Digitact and Digitone as well. Maybe not exactly this, but you can see where I'm going here. So I have this kind of breakdown here. I took the main sample and 
um, let's just talk about process for a second here. I took the main sample and I have an LFO that is affecting its volume and then its sample rate is being reduced quite a bit and the filter is up. So if you listen, it sounds like this. I think the amp and hold is, yeah. Or the, excuse me, the hold and the release is being, um, you know, affected by the scene here. Um, so let's bring everything in here. In this breakdown, I wanted to bring in a, another sample to kind of reinforce the impact of the quote-unquote drop, I guess, that happens. Um, so if you listen, I have a digitone over here making these melodies, but that's, that's not relevant. So now we go to this scene. this clap that comes in. So let's talk about what's going on with that, because there's a few things going on. So for one thing, the way that I did this, if that's unclear, is I have this clap on track three, and it's muted in every other scene except for scene 16. So when I click on the scene 16, it's at max volume here. Uh, but if I go to scene 15, minimum, 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 you get it. One of the things that I wanted to do was have the clap be sent to the reverb for a big kind of sound, right? But if that happens every time the sequencer goes around, it gets a little repetitive, it gets a little grating, it gets a little annoying. And don't get me wrong, I love being repetitive and grating and annoying. It's like my job. Just ask my wife. But in my music, I really, I, I do try to tone that down a little bit. So how do you do that? It's kind of a conundrum because you might think, well, you idiot, you just put your finger here, turn up the reverb, and you're done. It'll, it'll happen on that trigger, right? Uh, but, 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 but it's going to happen every single time. I would say to you, a less wise man than I, the Socrates of the Octatrack, Soctactatrees. Um, and how do you work around that? So the sort of big-brained, uh, insert brainlit meme scenario that I came up with was using a trigless trig to snap the reverb and the, the time and the mix down to zero and having that trigger every second time. So that technically this is being sent to the reverb every single time, but every second time this is clamping down on it almost instantly so that you don't hear the reverb at all. And in that way, we are able to achieve what I wanted, which is the clap being sent to the reverb every second time. And obviously you could take this further and stack additional effects or have it trigger every, you know, third or fourth time, or even put a percentage on this, a percentage value that says, you know, you know, 30% of the time this clamps down on the reverb and it doesn't. You can get really generative really fast with the Octatrack in this way. So if we listen now, you can hear what's happening. So it's going to trigger. And then the second time around, it won't. And in that way, I reaffirm my status as the Octatrack God. If you know a better way to do that or a less roundabout way, please tell me. Because one of the things I've loved is having people comment things that seem like super basic knowledge that I just don't possess because of my utter utter refusal to crack open a manual. I won't do it. You can't make me do it. The only manuals I want to associate with are my friends who are named Manuel and the ones you do on a skateboard. You can't see it now, but I'm tilting back in a manual fashion. Anyway, something else that's going on in this track. I have a trigger here that is happening every, I believe, oh, I guess I have it ever happening every time. Well, it happens every time. Uh, and all this is is just a little reverse uh, because that little is just, we love it, right? We love that. Something else I did was just messing with some trigless trigs after the, after the clap here. And what I ended up with in a happy accident um, is I modulated the reverb time here. Um, I turned up the mix and the time a little bit. And then I abruptly snapped the time down. Um, and... I don't really know how or why it happens this way, 
but it gets this cool, like I said, sort of stepped feel where it goes, quapoom. You'll hear it. Um, it triggers every second time, so let's uh, wait for it to come back around, and you'll hear what I mean. There's that reverse. Right here. Coming up. You hear that? And that's just kind of this cool, weird thing that happens. Um, and so having that happen every second time, it gives just, there's just always kind of something new happening for the listener. Um, and if you've watched my previous videos, you know that we wouldn't just be sitting here letting this play. We would be messing with other scenes. We would be um, doing all kinds of stuff to keep the interest even that much more focused on, on what we're doing. We keep the beat anyway that much more varied. Um, what else, what else, what else, what else? I think I have some minor bit crushing um, and delay sending going on um, on this little field sample I have here. So let's listen to that because it's kind of subtle. Obviously, you can hear the bit crushing. I think this is happening every second time. Um, so what's happening there is I have a little bit of bit crushing, a little bit of sample reduction, and then on, I believe, yeah, on the second snare, I have the delay being sent so that you get this kind of, right? And then on one of these last ones here, I have the delay being sent again, but the time is different. So instead of a ta 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 you get a ta da da ta da ta um, So if you listen... Oh, this happens every second time, apparently. That makes sense. Right, so even though this doesn't directly involve trigless trigs, I just think it's an interesting thing uh, that can be applied to your process. That's kind of it, I guess, for now. Uh, it's a, might be This might be a shorter video than my previous ones, but I think that trigless trigs in general are a thing that I really don't see people talking about, and it confuses me because because of that, Sometimes I would accidentally put a trigless trig on the sequencer, which 30 minutes into the video, let me tell you how you put in a trigless trig. If you hold function and press here, uh, that's how you put in a trigless trig. Um, worth noting, if you put in a trigless trig like this and then try to turn it off just by clicking, it'll put in a normal trigger. So be wary of that. So if you want to take it off right away, just keep holding function and do that. I'll probably edit that to the beginning of the video so that it is useful to someone. But anyway, I don't see people talking about trigless tricks. I rarely see them come up in people's processes. And a lot of people, I think, that even know about them are not really quite sure how to practically apply them. Um, and so leave it to me, uh, the Aristotle of electron devices, to come in and say, use it like this. Maybe it'll be useful to you. Maybe not. So I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, I hate that I, I have to like that this is a meme. Um, me asking for engagement, but genuinely, <laughs> really genuinely, I don't give a fuck about engagement. I have 285 um, subscribers. Also, I don't give a fuck about engagement because I'm married, dog. Ooh, I'm pinned down. Ball and chain? Me. Uh, whipped? Me. Hitched? Me. Hitch, starring Will Smith and Kevin James? The hit film? Romantic comedy? Hitch? Uh, it's about me. I'm married. And my ring is gorgeous, by the way. Thank you for noticing. Can I get a little focus here on my ring? Yeah. Look at that. Anyway, I do genuinely want to hear from you guys um, if you use trigless tricks in different ways, um, if there are easier ways to do what I'm doing, if I'm totally fucking wrong about something, uh, tell me and be mean about it if you need to, um, because I think that the my comment section is just too fucking sweet, um, which I appreciate. I love you all. Uh, like you're you're all my children. Um, you're all my babies, no matter how old you are, and I will coddle you and love you forever. Uh, but, you know, rebel against me a little bit. I'm your dad. I'm your octo dad. So, you know, tell me I don't understand your process, and we'll have a dialogue. Another thing I want to talk about before I, before I go and engage in the Sisyphean task that is editing, I want to talk about the direction I want to take this channel um, insofar as it matters to anybody watching. I don't know that I only want to do Octatrack videos forever. 
specifically because I don't think I have Octatrack videos in me forever. I want to do a video on parts, and that's probably it. Um, I don't know that I have a lot more worthwhile shit to offer, and I'm certainly trying to learn more so that I can offer more. Um, I probably have another video in me about random tips that I have, random things that I'm picking up over time. But regardless, I make music not just on the Octatrack. I make music in Ableton. I make music on the Digitone. I use some pedals over yonder. I make music in a lot of different ways. And so I'd love to make more videos just about the process of making music and some tips that I have for making music in general. And so I will try to keep it, you know, applicable to people that can't necessarily afford Ableton Suite or the Digitone or, you know, a variety of boutique pedals. I'm not trying to flex. I can barely afford this stuff and I usually end up selling it anyway. But regardless, I want to I want to know what you what kind of stuff you guys want to see. I want to know whether or not that sounds interesting to you or whether I should keep pushing to find new ways to use the Octatrack and kind of get, keep giving you my perspective on that. So let me know. Yell at me in the comments. Brutalize me. Dehumanize me. Step on me. Um, I'm your submissive Octatrack dad. You're my sweet baby children who are also doming me in this situation. You know what? This is getting really weird. Thank you for watching. Thank you for all the super duper nice comments. I really no memes. They make my fucking day uh, every time I read them, and I do read all of them. I try to respond to all of them like a big fucking dork, but if I miss you, it's because I have a personal vendetta against you, and it is personal. It's super personal. So harbor that aggression and uh, unleash it on someone undeserving. So anyway, that's going to be it for me. I hope everyone is staying safe and staying largely sane during these increasingly fucked up and and frustrating times if you ever need to talk to anybody about anything uh, my messages are always open and I'm always willing to listen and that's a that's a genuine I know I kind of layer everything in six layers of irony but genuinely speaking this is not a time where anyone should feel like they're alone so if you feel like you need someone to talk to you and you genuinely don't have anybody um, you have me, your submissive Octatrack dad, to step on. So come step on me, dude. All right. Have a good one, guys. And let me know what you think about the future of this channel and videos and all that great stuff. I will talk to you later. Peace in the Middle East.